This lecture series was initiated by Dr. Shin Akasofu, who was director of the Institute uh, a few years back, and it's continued for 30 years until today. In the past, these talks would have been delivered personally in Anchorage and Juneau, as well as in Fairbanks. Dr. McCoy is the seventh director of the Geophysical Institute, leading them in science from the center of the Earth to the center of the Sun since 2011. He has degrees in physics from Cornell and Texas A&M. He also has a PhD in astrogeophysics from the University of Colorado Boulder. He has decades of experience as a space scientist working with the Navy with many projects funded by Naval Research Lab and NASA. He's also a fellow of the American Meteorological Society. Bob McCoy is well known for his work in the upper atmosphere science field and is a rocket-borne uh, ultraviolet detector man. One of those rockets was flown from Poker Flat, which is more than I've ever done. GI has specialized research going in geology, volcanology, seismology, cryophysics, infrasound, atmospheric, and space science. It has its own special science library, a machine shop, an electronic shop, a rocket range, a comprehensive satellite facility, a center for the development and implementation of unmanned aerial vehicles, the Alaska Earthquake Information Center, and the Alaska Volcano Observatory. These assets have been deployed with great success, enabling continued advances in a broad range of high latitude science areas, all supported by grant and contract funding and the directorship of Bob McCoy. Guided by Dr. McCoy's leadership, the GI is well placed to spring forward in the upcoming quarter century. Now hear from Dr. McCoy about the GI's first 75 years and beyond. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks Roger, and thanks, thanks Rod. And, and let me extend my welcome to everybody to the uh, First Science for Alaska lecture series in 2022. Thanks also to, to uh, Kelly and Daniel for helping put this, put this together. Uh, th there's three anniversaries coming up this year. There's the 75th anniversary of the Geophysical Institute this, this past year, 30th anniversary for the Science for Alaska lecture series, and 30th anniversary of the, of the Alaska Satellite Facility. On the sixth lect lecture, uh, the Vice Chancellor for Research, Dr. Nettie LaBelle Hammer, is going to be talking about the, uh, 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 the anniversary of the, of the uh, Alaska Satellite Facility. So when I thought about doing this talk, I thought about how much science has come out of the Geophysical Institute in 75 years. And that's a daunting task. Uh, I actually thought about it for a minute, how much science is coming out right now from the, science, from the Geophysical Institute? And I thought even that's a daunting task. So I'll leave history to the books from, from Neil Davis and the books from, from Ned Rozelle that he's written and, and will write. And I thought I'd just talk about what's going on today at the GI and how much, how much more science you should expect in the next 75 years. So quick history, uh, we were created 75 years ago by Congress. Um, today there's about 380 of us. We're growing and by the end of the, this next year, we, there should be about 400 of us in the GI, faculty, staff, and students. We're divided into seven research groups, I think Roger mentioned, nine major operational programs and 10 other facilities. Last year, we were about $64 million. That's how much we spent. And we have some funding from the state as general fund. And in 2018, uh, we became a uh, university-affiliated research center for the Department of Defense for geophysical detection of nuclear proliferation. So, so to geophysic, geophysicists in the GI, uh, Alaska is one great big laboratory. We have a lot of geophysical phenomena that no other university, no other research university has access to. And in particular, uh, Aurora, uh, there's a great bright Aurora a couple nights ago. The solar cycle is increasing by 2025, which should be at solar maximum. There should be some, some great auroral displays. Uh, volcanoes, we have 54 active volcanoes in Alaska. And there's usually three or four erupting or active at any, any one time. Uh, permafrost, a lot of us in Fairbanks know what permafrost is, uh, but 90% of the states is on permafrost. Earthquakes, uh, our Alaska Earthquake Center last year and the year before counted 50,000 earthquakes in Alaska and a magnitude seven about every, every couple years. Uh, ice, there's 
more than a million square miles of sea ice in the winter around Alaska. Uh, th this is, I'll talk about this more, this is an, an ice exercise conducted by the Navy with GI scientists' help back in uh, 2018. Glaciers. There's at least 30,000 glaciers in 40% of the surface water on, on, in the United States. And we have some very strange weather, especially these times of, this time of year when it's very cold out and the air is very stable and, uh, and we let, get lots of ice fog. So I, I mentioned seven research groups. Uh, we have atmospheric science, uh, remote sensing, uh, seismology, snow, ice, and permafrost, space physics and aeronomy, tectonics and sedimentation, and volcanology. Our scientists, staff, and, and students uh, work in these disciplines. And it turns out the research groups are actually a great, uh, a great artifact. It helps uh, cohesion around, uh, around disciplines in the, uh, in the GI. Um, we have a number of uh, facilities. The Alaska Volcano Observatory on the third floor of this building. The Alaska Earthquake Center, also on the third floor. Uh, Alaska Satellite Facility, we'll, we'll be talking more about that in the satellite dishes you see deployed around campus and around, uh, uh, around town. Uh, Polka Flat Research Range, the uh, only university-owned rocket range in the country and the largest land-based rocket range in the world. And we have about 90 uh, uh, NASA people coming up and scientists and NASA people coming up the next few weeks for a series of three rocket launch campaigns uh, coming up this winter. Uh, the Alaska Center for Unmanned Aircraft System Integration. We've been flying unmanned aircraft for about 20 years. Uh, a lot's happening in that area. We used to be a DOD high-performance computing center. Uh, we're not anymore, but we have quite a bit of, D of, 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 D of uh, high-performance computing and data storage that helps enable all the research across the uh, Geophysical Institute. The Wilson Alaska Technical Center, these guys measure infrasound. This is a station at, at uh, McMurdo, their station for the South Pole. And this is this activity, infrasound listening, is what helped us become a, a university-affiliated research center back in 2018. And then finally, HARP, the High Frequency Active Rural Research Program, which became part of the GI in 2015. So we'll talk about volcanoes. This is, this is a page off of the uh, Alaska Volcano Observatory website. There's 54 active volcanoes. You can see them distributed along, along the lesions. About, about 26 of these have sensors on them, seismic, uh, uh, infrasound, uh, uh, GPS. And uh, right now, there's, if you go to the, the AVO website, there's four volcanoes uh, that are active. Great Sitkin, uh, Davidoff, Pavlov, and semi sapochnoi semi sapochnoi is one of my favorites because it's located, it's located over here just past the 180 meridian. Which, which means that Alaska is the easternmost state in the United States. Uh, that always mo boggles my mind to be the northern, western, and easternmost state. But semi fortunately, which is active right now, is, is just past that meridian. Uh, volcanology doesn't limit itself to, to uh, Alaska. It's, it stretches over into Russia. And some of our scientists go into Kamchatka to, to make experiments of volcanoes and to teach classes. This is Pavel Izbekov with a class summer school in Kamchatka looking at volcanoes. He says it's pretty cold and miserable sometimes in the winter in Kamchatka. Uh, 40 below zero, 50 mile an hour winds. W one of the things you learn is that, uh, taking this class is how to dig a Russian helicopter out of the snow. One of the, one of the things you learn as a, as a student. Okay, seismology. Um, I, I mentioned 50,000 earthquakes. Uh, Mike West shows this chart that shows where the seism seismicity is aligned uh, al along this fault line, along the Aleutians. Um, students, staff, and faculty spend most of their summers flying around Alaska in, in helicopters, putting in seismic states in the, in the earthquake center, digging holes, putting up uh, telemetry, uh, solar cells, replacing batteries, and, 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 place, and putting up new sensors. Sometimes you see these, these shelters they leave around um, get chewed on by a bear. A bear was trying to uh, claw into this one. We, we train our students with shotguns, and we and we equip them before they go into the field with shotguns, bear spray, and, and, uh, and, and, bear, and radios. Uh, one of the things that Mike West has been doing on some of these shelters is putting weather stations. You see here on the top of these, of these, of these shelters. Uh, this is a new innovation to provide temperature, wind, and, and weather sensing, and that's gonna be important. Uh, in this next slide, this is, this, is a, this is a slide showing the location of a program the Natural Science Foundation put into place called the uh, Earthscope. 
where they put in uh, it's a two-year program. They put in 193 stations around Alaska. Uh, these have seismic GPS infrasound, and a lot of them have weather stations. And so, for example, if there's an earthquake, for example, in this case, Kaktovik, you can see these things ring as that, as that seismic wave passes, passes through, the, through, that, uh, through the state. Mike West and others have been able to keep, of those 193, about half of them, I think, uh, in the southern part and now in the northern part of Alaska, that provides a great deal of, of, of data to, uh, to, to study Alaska seismology in ways we've never had before, but also to study the weather in ways that we haven't done before and maybe help improve uh, weather, weather forecasting in Alaska. Permafrost. Everybody who lives in, in, in Fairbanks knows about permafrost. It's on, uh, like I said, 90% of the state. Uh, we all know of houses that have sunk in, into the ground. Uh, permafrost thaw and, and subsidence along the coastlines is a, is a real problem. And every year, roads have to be rebuilt in, in Fairbanks and other, other places. The, uh, the pipeline was built on permafrost at various lo locations. And it uses passive uh, uh, radiators to keep the ground cold. Uh, another phenomenon that, that uh, Vladimir Romanovsky talked about in, in one of our Science for Alaska talks a couple years ago was these methane explosion craters. I'm not sure what they're called. These, these are, have been appearing across Siberia. There's a number of them. They're about, according to Vladimir, about 50 meters uh, in diameter. Apparently methane is somehow exploding and blowing the, the mud, dirt, and, and everything out. And, and perhaps the, the amount of methane coming out of the ground is actually accelerating. I think on NOVA tomorrow there's a special on this, and you'll, you'll, you'll hear more about this and, and something uh, from Vladimir. This is mostly in Siberia, but Vladimir thinks it's happening in the U.S. and, and, and even in Canada, or it could be happening. And so it's, it's, a, it's an important, it's an important uh, uh, problem to solve for, for permafrost researchers. Ice. Um, I mentioned the ice X. The, the Navy every year had an ice X exercise where they build a camp out on the Arctic Ocean. Uh, they bring in aircraft and, and, and drop people off and submarines show up. A few years ago, it didn't go so well. Uh, the camp ice, ice leads opened up, and they had to abandon camp. So a couple years ago, uh, back in, in 2018, they contacted Andy Mahoney, who helped set up a camp. What you, Andy, working with um, Hyo Icon, found areas where they had thick ice. You could build a camp, but right next to thin ice, new ice. And first-year ice is nice and smooth, and that allows you to build a runway. So that camp was a great success. Uh, since then, the ISEX has still gone on every other year uh, with, with Andy's participation. There's some, there's some really cool YouTube videos. Uh, but back in 2020, there were actually three submarines that showed up, two U.S. and one British. Uh, Andy was out there for a week setting this up. He's been out there every year. And, and there's a mini ISEX that comes up in alternate years. When Andy went out there, I asked him, did, you, did, did they invite you down inside the submarine? And he said, yeah. I said, did they feed you? He said, no, he got a cup of coffee. So I've been encouraging the Navy to to feed Andy, it does all that great weight for you. But you can see how, how important it is uh, supporting, supporting the DOD and the, uh, and the Navy for ice, ice research. Uh, this weekend, uh, this week, uh, Matthew Sturm is in Oregon. He's got a uh, Science for Alaska, I'm sorry, he's got a uh, Navigating the New Arctic uh, uh, grant from the National Science Foundation. And he's setting up a, a museum display, 2,500 square feet, called Snow Tiny Crystals Global Impact. This was, uh, this w there was an introduction by Senator Murkowski, and this exhibit, uh, I, think it, I think it's already live in Oregon at the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. I believe in the spring of 2023, this, this uh, display, this museum display will be coming here to our Museum of the North, I hope so, and we'll all be able to see it just, just across the street down there. But this is, this is actually great work, and snow is important, especially in Alaska. It's, it, it provides water, it provides uh, reflectivity for the sun, which keeps the earth cool. And, and for a lot of, a lot of uh, development, it provides roads that, that people can drive on, that equipment can, can pass across. And lacking snow uh, Im impacts that. Uh, I mentioned infrasound. Infrasound is, is sound at frequencies below what your ears can hear. You can hear it down to about 20 megahertz. But, it, but the frequencies below what your ears can hear, there's a lot going on. Um, that, that sound. Uh, it's produced by things like volcanoes, uh, seismic events, earthquakes, lightning, and even the aurora produces infrasound. But more importantly, uh, 
uh, nuclear events, an explosion in the atmosphere, or other explosions, vehicles, uh, and generators. So those sounds propagate large distances. And to give you an example of that, every, everyone's uh, seen the Honga Tonga uh, submarine volcano eruption back in January 15th. This is a NASA photo of that. Uh, David Fee, uh, working with Alaska Volcano Observatory and the, uh, and the, and the UARC, recorded the sound as it passed over Fairbanks. It came across, it, it, came, it took about nine hours for the sound to propagate 10,000 kilometers up from Honga Tonga to, to uh, Alaska. David heard it, it was about three in the morning, I think he thought somebody was getting into his garage, but it was actually the sound from this uh, submarine volcano. Apparently this is the longest that anybody's ever, longest distance anybody's ever recorded sound. You can see in the bottom right uh, the recording that he made uh, with microphones. There's, there's microphones in, in Fairbanks and there's microphones uh, in, uh, around the world. I'll show you some of those in a, in a second. This sound came up from the south after nine hours. Many hours later, it actually came up. It went around the, the earth to the south. It came up and then came down from the north. And then the sound continued to ring around the earth four times and, and maybe more before the sound level uh, uh, receded down into, uh, into noise levels. So this sound just propagates a, a very long time, a very long way. And with microphones distributed around the world, we, uh, the Volcano Observatory in, in the Wilson Alaska Technical Center can record this and measure these, these sounds and geolocate where the sounds come from. So, so WATSI, the Wilson Alaska Techn Technical Center, um, has, has these, these sites uh, around, around uh, Alaska and, and uh, Shimia the woods behind the building um, up here. And like, like I said, at the South Pole and, and McMurdo, here's a station at Wake. Wake was pretty near that, that eruption. These, these, these uh, trailers provide power, uh, keep, keep equipment and power to, to, um, to monitor those, uh, those, those microphones. And so the Department of Defense got pretty interested in this. They had been for a while, but they, they, they created this new UARC um, to help expedite uh, this kind of research and the monitoring for atmospheric, atmospheric bursts at, at very, high, very high volume. You see a lot of dishes are on the top of the LV building and, and the woods around us and even down uh, off of Badger Road. If you want to image the Earth from space, you do it with a, a, a polar orbiting satellite. That satellite will orbit over the poles of the Earth roughly. And as the Earth rotates underneath, you can image every part of the Earth. If you look here to the right, a polar orbiting satellite uh, it comes over comes overhead, it orbits 14 times a day, but it comes over Fairbanks about 11 of those 14 orbits. So this is a great place to put a dish to pull down that data. And so, as, as you'll hear on the sixth, ledger, sixth lecture, Nettie LaBelle Hamer will be talking about how, how, that, how they've been doing this work for, for uh, 30 years. So there's three dishes. Uh, I won't go too much detail, you'll hear about it later. Three, one on top of this building, two in the woods. These are 11 meter dishes. Uh, and there's, there's uh, four more down, down the road, two, a nine, a seven, and, and most recently, uh, NASA uh, put in a, uh, a K-band dish. Th these other ones are S and X-band. Uh, this is Netty working with the Coast Guard. They put in a one-meter dish a few years ago so the Coast Guard could talk to some small satellites that they had launched for search and rescue. And here's the, uh, here's the satellite dish. You can see this big dome. It's the only, one, only big one under a dome. It's just off the, the uh, Richardson Highway. You look to the right as you're heading south, and you see this. Um, this. This dish will be very useful when NASA launches the NISAR, the NASA, NASA uh, ISRO, Indian Space Research Organization, Synthetic Aperture Radar Satellite. That's going to pull down quite a, quite a bit of data. Um, in fact, I think they're gonna, that, that satellite will, will generate 150 petabytes in a, in a, in a few, about two or three years. So most of the data that comes down to synthetic aperture radar, that's that's radar. That's that's a power on the satellite that, that, that radiates to the ground. That light is that radiation is reflected back and collected at the satellite. So it works at night. It works in day. It works through clouds. This is this is a SAR image of the Cook Inlet. You can see over here to the right. This is Anchorage. So it's a very powerful uh, capability. And the Department of Defense now has been working with Alaska Satellite Facility and the and the Enterprise through something called the Arctic Geo, Geodata Cooperative to uh, bring this data into the NGA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, for, for, for DOD applications from the SAR, SAR data. And some of the things that, that ASF does to help the country, these were floods after Hurricane Ida last year in, 
August in New Orleans. And what you can see in a single pass, SAR data, you can see all the flooding around New Orleans. That data was collected with satellites and they're downlinked here and, and processed and distributed out. ASF generates about, or downlinks about 40% of NASA's polar orbiting data in a, in a good day. We have a second facility in the GI called the Geographic Information Network of, of Alaska, GINA. They have a couple of one meter dishes. They talk to, to uh, NOAA satellites, NOAA weather satellites and downlink data. This is an example of the products that they generate and, and, and propagate out. This shows snow over northern Alaska clouds. This was summertime, I believe, and, uh, or October. Not too much sea ice, but, you can, but in these images you can see snow ice and, and sea ice. Um, this, this past winter, uh, the Sekuliak was up in the, operating in the Arctic. And, and the next lecture is by Bernie, Bernie Coakley. He'll be talking about that, some of his hard, uh, research and hard times in the, in the Arctic. Uh, GINA satellite, GINA was downlinking data from NOAA satellites, providing sea ice data, and linking it in real time to the Sekuliak. So I think, this is, I think this is where Bernie was on the Sekuliak. This green line shows where he wanted to be. They had to, they had to scout around, skirt around ice flows. But they used the data from GINA's satellite retrievals to uh, guide that. And I think Bernie will tell you more about that uh, next, next Tuesday. OK, this is a familiar sight to all of us in Fairbanks, especially days like today, when it's, when it's clear, sunny, cold, uh, and inversions, and lots of ice fog. You see a lot of activity. Uh, with, with a group led by Bill Simpson in a program called ALPACA, the Alaskan Layered Pollution and Chemical Analysis Project. There are about 40 scientists have come to Alaska uh, last couple of weeks, and we'll be here for, be here for a time, trying to, trying to gather data on all the things that go into creating the, the air quality in, in Alaska. This is a bit of a busy uh, slide, but, it, but this cartoon shows all the things that they'll be measuring, L looking at uh, outflows from, from uh, power plants, looking what happens from, from stoves, looking inside buildings, outside. A lot, of the, a lot of the research is being conducted down by CTC, but also in some homes around Alaska. If you see some of the balloons being launched out in the agricultural fields, that's, that's part of this program. So ALPACA, it's another one of these na uh, navigating the new Arctic programs from the, from the National Science Foundation. Uh, next, I want to switch to rockets. These were, these were four rockets that were launched about, about, uh, about two or three years ago. It was about 30 below zero. I was outside with these, watching these rockets. These are two-stage rockets launched out of poker. Two of them were launched within a few seconds of each other, and two of them were launched about 20 minutes apart. That's the first stage, and there you can see the second stage, Ignite. Uh, they went on up. These rockets were doing research in the mesosphere, lower thermosphere. Rich, Richard Collins and, and colleagues were doing studies of, of what happens in that, that region. They use these rockets. And they used uh, uh, emissions from trimethyl aluminum, but also uh, the LIDAR facility out at Poker to study, study turbulence in the, in the uh, mesosphere, lower thermosphere. At Poker, we have a lot of facilities. We've been launching rockets for 52 years uh, for the NASA and for the Department of Defense. This, if you look in this top left corner here, you can see where most of the rockets launch. We have, we have to avoid the pipeline. We launch into these seven zones, avoiding the pipeline and staying out of Canada. Sometimes they launch all the way out into the Arctic Ocean, depending on how high they want to go and, and what the payload is. A typical payload, uh, a typical rocket consists of a couple rocket motors you see down here at the bottom and a scientific payload. Up on the, up on the ridge at a poker is, is the uh, Neil Davis Science Building. And there's lots of instruments up there to study the aurora and the upper atmosphere. Rockets are mounted to, the, to a rail, you can see here, with umbilicals connected. The rocket's encapsulated in, in styrofoam. And the whole building is moved back, the rocket's elevated, and then the, the, uh, the team can wait till the, the aurora is just right and, and launch. This is, this is Rich Collins in, in one of his, his four rockets, uh, calculated in styrofoam, being heated from the bottom, heat flowing into this, into this, uh, this chamber. And when the conditions are just right, they, they, they launched uh, those four rockets. Uh, this is some of the videos, some of the photographs from that night. You can see. Uh, two-stage rockets. This white, this white cloud you see here is trimethyl aluminum. Trimethyl aluminum, when ejected at night, glows. And as it falls, it, it forms a white cloud. That's, and the canisters are falling from about 80 or 90 kilometers. What you, 
What you see also here are lasers. This is the LIDAR facility, which is shining lasers up to that same, same region. There, like I said, there were four rockets, and these, these white splotches are the trimethyl aluminum. These are some photographs that I took that, that evening. You can see the lasers. There's, there were three of them. Two of them you can see, green and, and sort of orange. Here, here, here you see the canister start to fall, and as it falls, the wind shears it out. You see, you see uh, uh, there's quite a bit of wind up there, and it's hard to see the wind, so this is an excellent way to, to map the winds uh, in the upper atmosphere. And it, looks, it looks very strange as viewed from the bottom. Cameras are placed around Alaska to view this and to triangulate and get, get the winds out of this. Uh, this next photo is something that somebody sent me. I think it's photoshopped because, because the guys that did this were from Clemson. I don't think they would have put UAF, but it's, it's pretty exciting. There was lot, lots of great aurora that night uh, when Rich and his team carried out their experiment. Uh, this is, this is a, a recent experiment. Uh, Mark Conde and Don Hampton and others went to Norway a few weeks ago and launched, launched another rocket to study the upper atmosphere, this time looking at, at the thermosphere and the ionosphere. Again, they, they, they had canisters of deployables, uh, barium and strontium. The barium deploys, and you can see it briefly, but it ionizes, and, and then once it's ionized, the electric fields and magnetic fields will cause it to move away. So I'm going to show this movie. You'll see that the strontium, the strontium uh, also glows, but it doesn't, it, it's not affected by the ionosphere. So in this movie, and maybe I'll play it twice, you, you can see the barium charges exploding, and then you see the barium ionizing and then moving up and being sheared off along uh, field lines. And these are the strontium, strontium bulges over here. So it's pretty exciting. It allows the team, again with cameras from the ground, it allows the team to measure the neutral atmosphere up high, the, the ionosphere, winds, and, and fields. So it's a, it's, it's a pretty exciting way to do this. Mark and, and team have done this several times. The trimethyl aluminum that I talked about, that's been done by Clemson. Uh, but Clemson has been working with the GI, and we're going to be transitioning th that technology here to, uh, to the GI. So we'll be doing those things in the future. Okay. Unmanned aircraft. Uh, we've been flying in the GI unmanned aircraft for 20 years. Uh, a few small platforms, but there's been quite a bit of growth the last few years. The, 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 there's a number of applications. These two platforms you see in the bottom left, this is, this is a Griffith Aerospace uh, Sea Hunter, 18-foot wingspan. They can fly for about, I think, 11 hours or so. These have been deployed by a quasi, the Alaska Center for Unmanned Aircraft System Integration, up to Canada the last couple of years to look for right whales. Uh, the Canadian shipping have been killing too many right whales, so using artificial intelligence, the quasi team's been, been detecting those whales and warning shipping. Uh, this, this aircraft on the right is a, is a sentry. You can see that there's quasi on several of those. Those are surplus military aircraft. Uh, they've been flying those out of, out of, out of Clear uh, Airport, out by uh, uh, Clear Air Force Station. And they're working with the FAA. The, the primary goals of, of a lot of this research is to, is to separate manned aircraft and unmanned aircraft and make it safe so that large unmanned aircraft can fly safely around manned aircraft. Uh, they're also trying to promote industry, uh, get industry in Alaska to, to, to take this on. They're, doing, they're working on cargo delivery, and they're trying to get these aircraft to fly off of, off of uh, for example, Fairbanks International Airport. Here's a little video showing, uh, showing some of the flights of, out, out, of the, out of Clear Airport. I'll let it run, let it run for a second. Some of the quasi-team. Uh, they have a number of aircraft. Some of them are electric. Some of them, these are gasoline, and some of them are hybrid. They have, they're both. They have, they have helicopters, hexacopters that can fly for a few hours that are hybrid uh, to do small things. And they'll be working on cargo delivery, showing how it can be done safely, and then transitioning that off to, uh, transitioning that off to industry. Filling with gasoline. And hopefully you'll see these taxing up behind aircraft at, uh, at Fairbanks International soon. It hasn't been done anywhere in the country. A quasi has done a lot of things that no one in the country has done uh, commercially, like, like fly beyond the line of sight. They've flown over the pipeline, and, and they're involved with several, uh, several, FAA, uh, several FAA initiatives to, make, uh, to separate the two airspaces and make it safe. Okay, uh, getting near the end of my talk here, this is, this is HARP, the High Frequency Active Aurora Research Program. It's located in at mile 11 and a half off the Tok Highway in Kokona. 
It's a, what it is, it's a large uh, ham radio. It's the largest, most powerful ham radio in the world. It's got 180 antennas, dipole antennas. Uh, it's got 360 transmitters. They're all powered by this building over here, the power plant. It can, trans it can transmit in the HF, which is the ham frequencies from 2.8 to 10 megahertz. Uh, it was built by the Department of Defense uh, about 20 years ago for about 300 million. The Air Force decided they didn't, they didn't want it anymore. Uh, so, in, so instead of destroying it, they gave it to the university. Uh, they gave it to the GI. It's powered by these uh, five tugboat generators that can gen pretty loud. These can generate uh, 4,000 horsepower each. each. Uh, this is, the most, like I said, the most powerful uh, transmitter in the world. And we can do a number of things in the upper atmosphere. Uh, General Masiello gave it to, to the Chancellor uh, Brian Rogers back in 2015, the key to the, key to the facility ownership. It took us about a year and a half to get it operational, but we uh, carried out some campaigns. This, this, is a, this is an experiment that Chris Fallon did where he can use HARP to generate uh, artificial aurora. This is, this is kind of faint looking. It's actually reddish, but it took a spot overhead uh, uh, and, and created aurora. Chris always used a, a slow scan TV when he's modulating a signal. So what that does, it gives the ham operators a signal. So ham operators around the country, around the world, will pick up the signal. Here's one in British Columbia. So as, as we're doing experiments in the upper atmosphere, in the ionosphere, uh, ham operators can, can pick this up. Canadians have actually come down to HARP and working with Jessica Matthews, they've used this same technique to take art and, and imagery and transmit it out uh, into the ionosphere and, and off the ionosphere, uh, bouncing around the world. This is, this is an NRL scientist, Paul Bernhard, who came in uh, last summer and placed a bunch of antennas, about 26 antennas at Delta Junction. You can see them in a row. They're actually relayed in an X. He was using HARP as an over-the-horizon radar facility to bounce radar, bounce HF off of the ionosphere and, and collect it at these antennas. His idea is to use this, these receivers to use HARP as the transmitter to map out big areas of, of land for over-the-horizon radar. Uh, it's, HARP's very powerful, it's very, it's very, uh, very capable. I, most of the work I mentioned has is, is been GI and not Naval Research Laboratory. But January 1st, Paul Bernhardt retired from the Naval Research Laboratory and became a GI uh, professor. So Paul is now one of our guys. He's carried out a couple of these campaigns uh, already. He'll carry out another one of these campaigns uh, soon. The last one was in January. Jessica Matthews organized a, a, a campaign back in October they brought 12 students from around the country, graduate students and their advisors, to HARP uh, and, and to the GI and out to, actually out to Poker to do a number of ex, uh, experiments. Classes, classes at the GI and then go out and students would go out with their advisor to carry out experiments at, at, at HARP. To, um, this, is a great, this has been a great feeder for, for scientists, graduate students to get into the community and, uh, and, and to get, in, get into the field. So my final thing, I just want to talk about our, our, our planet walk. Most people think about the, the solar system is like this. It's, it's a bunch of planets, the sun, all kind of crowded in there. But if you look at it, if you, if you look at the, the solar system to scale, it's actually pretty thin. It's pretty spread out. So a couple years ago, the, the, the Society for Physics students put together a planet walk. Uh, Yukon Drive is almost exactly a mile long. So we decided to make a one mile scale model of the solar system. So the sun's out here to the west by, by, uh, by the Akasofu building. And Pluto, we decided to put Pluto in there. Uh, Peter Delamere is a, is a co-I on the, on, the, on, the, on the Pluto mission, so we decided to keep that as a planet. But if you walk along, if you walk along Yukon, you can see all the, the distances of all the planets, a lot of information. There's a lot of information on these signs, like, like how many moons does each planet have? Which, which planets have aurora? Which planet, if you put it in a big tub of water, would it float? Um, and so it's a great, great activity. I'd encourage you, if you're, if you're, if you're in the area, come and, and start over here to the, to the west and head east, and you can walk down and see the locations, relative locations of all the planets. And with that, thanks very much. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. And I'm going to hand this back to Rod. Uh, thanks, Dr. McCoy. Uh, great presentation. And like I told folks, you know, when I work here at the News Miner, I, I learn something every day. And, uh, you know, I've learned things here this evening, too, about the place that I work. So that's, 
that's always good. Uh, we've got some questions from participants here, and of course, I, you know, I'm going to work in a couple of questions of my own here too. Um, okay. So let's just start. Um, just the easy questions. You keep the hard ones. Easy questions. Uh, let's see. Well, none of those. No, these are all right. Let's start with Angela McKenzie. Uh, she would like to know: Are there plans to have a harp open house again? Yeah, absolutely. The, the COVID has really crimped our style, um, research and otherwise. National Science Foundation, uh, uh, about a year ago, we won a large grant from the National Science Foundation to operate HARP. Uh, that, that, that grant helped pay for that, the uh, summer school that, that, that we carried out in October that Jessica Matthew carried out. But they want us to carry out a, every year an uh, open house. We did a few of those in the past uh, ourselves, but as soon as COVID is it's safe to go there, we'll do that. Uh, probably, probably late summer, we'll have an open house. We'll advertise that widely. And uh, it's important to get the word out about what, a, what an excellent facility is, and we want people to come and, and see it, and, and we want scientists to come and use it. You know, a, a question for me that just comes from your answer there to Angela's question. You mentioned the National Science Foundation, but what are some of the funding sources that, that pay for the research that goes on here? Sure. Uh, like I said, when we took ownership of, of it from the, from the Air Force, Air Force Research Lab, um, we had to fit the bill for a while. It took us about a year and a half to get it operational. But uh, scientists from the government labs and, and scientists from, from academia uh, wanted to use it. So, sci so from, from university, scientists would apply to the National Science Foundation to get grant funding. And the Naval Research Lab, the uh, Air Force Research Lab, and other, other government labs would get funding and come and pay for it. So right now, our biggest customer, our anchor tenant, is National Science Foundation. But the Naval Research Lab and, and other and, and AFRL are still doing experiments and still using it. We want to we want to make this a national laboratory. Uh, it, it is, but we want we want to grow it. So we've got five years to kind of expand that. It's in great shape. It's it's the most exquisite in the world, and um, there's a great deal of science you can do there that you can't do any place else uh, any place else in the world. What about uh, what about funding sources for uh, research beyond HARP? Sure. Well, like I said, the Canadians came down. The Canadian Ministry of of Education, I believe, uh, funded us to come down a couple times to use HARP okay. to do to do uh, art experiments. Okay. Taking right. art, converting it into radiation, and sending it out into the world. Uh, ham operators picked this up around the world, and it was distributing art um, in, in all in all dimensions, all du all directions. All right. Uh, we have a question from from Shannon Loeschbaugh. Uh, what is the current status of monitoring cloud cover over vast areas? Who specializes in studying that? Uh, the cloud cover is, is mostly the, the, uh, the province of, of NOAA. And like I said, GINA has two satellite dishes, a, a one meter here on top of the Akasofa building and one just down the road at Gilmore Creek. And they downlink data from those polar orbiting weather satellites, measuring cloud, da cloud data. And I showed you an example of one of their data products. So it's NOAA's job. Uh, Gina, Gina downlinks the data, creates products. Gina worked closely uh, in the summer with the fire service to provide warnings of fires and, and, and showing how fires uh, are, are propagating around Alaska. But clouds are most, mainly from NOAA. You know, another, another question for me as I listen to you speak here, um, you've been director for a little over 10 years now, I think it is. Um, what can you say about the pace of scientific advancement? Constantly, is it rapid? Yeah, it, it's it's amazing. Things have changed so much in the, in the in the ten years that I've been here. It makes you wonder what it's what it's been like the last seventy five years. What what the role of the GI has been? But but clearly, when you when you see that that our guys are on Nova tomorrow, we're opening museum exhibits and today this week, and um, there's so much going on around around the country that that leading edge research in the Arctic carried out by by uh, GI scientists. It's really it's really it's really amazing. Uh, Karen Perdue uh, wants to know, what areas of research do you see emerging in the next 10 to 20 years? That's, um, sure. Uh, yeah, uh, we're, we have a pretty, we have a pretty uh, uh, comprehensive uh, grasp on Arctic research. But new tools like, like machine learning, artificial intelligence, things like that are allowing, allowing us to do things in ways we haven't done before. Machines are getting faster. Uh, computing capability is getting greater. We've got a, quite a bit of quite a bit of data now, um, but some of the satellites, like the the uh, NICER satellite that I mentioned, it's going its data rate is going to be maybe ten times gr 
greater than anything before it. So more data, more data processing, more automated artificial intelligence data processing. That, that seems to be sort of cutting edge. Uh, another one for me here, and I know uh, uh, Roger Smith, your predecessor, in his introduction, he, he made a little kind of comment that, well, you know, Bob McCoy has launched a rocket. I haven't done that. What was your, what was your rocket launch experiment? It, it was fabulous. I launched a rocket back in the 90s. Uh, I was looking for pro precipitating protons, proton auroras, at it, and I launched it at poker. It's, uh, it's pretty exciting to go out and... and uh, Build a rock. I built it at the naval. I was at the naval research lab back then. Built it, uh, brought it out to poker and, and, and launched it. It was, it was successful. Uh, rocket science is, is is exciting, and and being able to do that at poker is is a, is a is a really really exciting thing. And uh, once you launch a rocket, it gets in your blood. It's hard to stop. It's great. It's great having these rocket launches to go out there and see them. It's often hard for for people in Fairbanks to see it because we don't know when they're going to launch. The, the uh, principal investigator gets to decide when it launches, and it could be four in the morning today or tomorrow the next day. We have a few launches coming up. NASA has decided that maybe they want to look at the sun from poker. So we can launch higher than any other place. Uh, for example, White Sands has to stay below 300 kilometers the apogees. We can go to 1,000 or 1,700 kilometers. Um, that'll, that gives you a lot more hang time. And, and, and we can also launch in response to an event. We can wait for something to happen like like a, a, uh, like, like a flare on the sun and then launch. You can't do that in any place else in the world. And then, re and then recover the payloads. My, my payload I launched back in the 90s, it came down on a parachute and I went out the next day and got it. These are things you can't do any place else. Go, go 1,000 kilometers, recover the payload. So the, the, the amount of capability with all these things is, is really, really amazing. And, and not only do we have people studying things like permafrost and sea ice and, and all these things, but it's all changing. The, the, the Arctic is warming at twice the rate of the rest of the planet. So what we know is changing even, even as we study it. So, You know, as we wind down here, oh, we have another question coming in. Uh, and I, uh, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing the name here, but Anurata Kalerzik. Uh, the question is, do you know when the next rocket will launch from Poker Flat, and can we watch the launch? Yeah, I, I don't know when it's going to launch. Uh, we, have three lo we have three launches between now and early March. There's windows that are, that are a few weeks long. And uh, like I said, it's hard, it's hard to tell. Uh, s some launches will actually be, have a schedule. And if that's the case, those will be published. And that will allow people, for example, you can go to uh, Ski Land and watch, watch the launch from Ski Land. That's a great place to watch a launch, especially if there's great, allure, great aurora. So it might be possible coming up. The solo launches, those will have schedules, and people will be able to watch them from Skigaland or someplace, All right. someplace remote. Um, I'm waiting to see if another one pops up here. It looks like somebody's typing something. But you know, as we start to wind down here, Director McCoy, um, you know, what do you find most fascinating about being director and coming to work here every day? It's, it's being around so many smart people. We have close to 400 really smart people. Very, very creative, hardworking. Don't mind the cold. We operate all over Alaska, all times of the year. So many new ideas. Every day, somebody brings me a new idea, uh, some, something, something new, something innovative. Uh, use, using, using equipment or, or facilities that we have and, and, and collaborating with others around the, around the world, around the country. It's, it's a joy to come to work every day. All right. Well. Um... I think that's going to do it here for our question session. So, uh, Director, thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate that. Great presentation. Great questions from folks. Um, I'm going to come back up in a sec here, and we're going to do, uh, we haven't talked about this earlier, but we're going to do some prizes. All right? Thanks for well, listening, and thanks for the great questions.